Greetings and welcome. Bonjour et bienvenue. I am Sobita Will, Director of the Future of Learning and Innovation Team at UNESCO. Welcome to the conference Beyond Disruption, Technology Enabled Learning Futures. We have a rich program for the coming days and I hope that uh, you've had a chance uh, to visit the menu of sessions available uh, on the website and if you haven't, I would encourage you to do so. Uh, during this opening panel, we will be hearing from national experiences in a, in a, a variety of uh, contexts and in diverse uh, technological ecosystems. But first, we will start with opening remarks from uh, Ms. Stefania Giannini, UNESCO Assistant Director General for Education, as well as from Doreen Bogdan Martin, Director, Telecommunications Development Bureau at the International Telecommunications Un Union, our uh, long standing partner in Mobile Learning Week. Um, ADG Giannini, Stefania, the floor is yours for opening remarks. Thank you, thank you very much, Sobi. Good morning, uh, good evening, or good afternoon, everybody. I'm sure we are connected with the entire community uh, of uh, education uh, colleagues and uh, and uh, tech uh, uh, ed tech as as usual in this. Uh, a mobile learning week uh, and let me say that this is the first uh, virtual uh, version of mobile learning week that has been brought the international head tech community together since uh, 2011 and uh, it's a special it's a special time we know we know all of us uh, it's a time of uh, of uh, reckoning uh, it's a time of uh, you know adapting the system to a very unprecedented uh, situation and it's also an exciting one, but one that puts us before uh, huge responsibility and, uh, and really unexpected challenges. Let me bit, uh, summarize some lessons learned uh, together with all our partners in the, in the last uh, few months. As many of you know, uh, this event was scheduled uh, to take place uh, uh, here in Paris uh, at UNESCO headquarters where I am today in the first week of March uh, when we were forced uh, to cancel it at the very short notice. Uh, sorry for that, but of course uh, something uh, enormous happened in the world, we can say like this. Since then, uh, uh, education has gone through a, a real uh, historic global disruption uh, with school closures uh, affecting over 90% of uh, uh, world student population. Uh, there are some numbers that uh, we repeat many times, but I think it's important to take in, 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 in our minds uh, at the peak of, of the crisis, the sanitary crisis, in terms of the impact on education. We had 1.6 billion students out of school. Uh, and today, uh, still uh, 500 million students uh, uh, in 35 countries remain affected by school-wide closures. So any conversation, any discussion, any proposal uh, on transforming the traditional model of school uh, and on leverage technology to do that, uh, to, you know, leverage technology is it's, it's a big part of uh, transforming education since uh, since uh, the, the beginning uh, of the of this crisis. The discussion was on that, but not only uh, in this uh, special uh, time. Well. Uh, any conversation uh, has to be held upon uh, to uh, has to be held up to the mirror of experience gained uh, during this uh, COVID-19 uh, time, and have to be uh, grounded on lessons already learned. Let me summarize a bit UNESCO perspective and our partners, I, I suppose, as we, we established from the very beginning, a, a new kind of partnership through the Global Education Coalition. And let me thank, uh, among other partners, uh, ITU uh, for being one of the very first. And, uh, and uh, Doreen, uh, uh, as, as, as director of, 
of uh, ITU uh, to be here with us today. Well, technology is no longer uh, supplementary to education systems and uh, education systems somehow rely on technology from the very beginning of this crisis. It has become uh, the sine qua non of learning continuity during this uh, crisis and it will be key to educational recovery as many governments uh, plan the future along uh, hybrid models. Almost overnight, the world needed an alternative to ensure uh, the continuity of learning uh, while students were confined at home. So the challenge became not simply connecting schools, but became somehow connecting people, connecting learners, connecting teachers. And ministries of education naturally turned to technology. Uh, let me say that solutions, different kinds of solutions range from high tech online solutions to low tech TV, radio channels. Uh, so we could see around the world uh, a real very prompt and, uh, and effective reaction to this unprecedented situation. And uh, it has been a steep learning curve to support countries to develop and deploy remote learning solutions we try to work together, as I already said, uh, in a different kind of, uh, of uh, partnership. And over the past months, partners, uh, we are now in this global education coalition, uh, around 150 of them uh, join forces to expand access to distance learning platforms, uh, to train teachers, uh, to, de to develop and use uh, and uh, be trained to use them and to digitize curricula and produce content, which can be, uh, of course, uh, adapted to the new, uh, to the new means we, we use. Some were quick uh, to see in, uh, in this shock, uh, born in a, somehow in an emergency, the trigger to deep uh, reforms to system, which have been invented definitely uh, in the last century or also something at the, at the, in, the, in, the, in the last decade of decades of, of the century before. And uh, across the world, education uh, began uh, a real pivot towards uh, distance learning, uh, building on programs, building on software systems that many uh, of you help to, to, to establish and create. Uh, I've heard that we have together a number of governments and ministers affirm that the past months have unlocked more innovation than in decades. I remember one of the very, very first ministerial conference and meetings we organized uh, and uh, the Minister of Education of Egypt who, uh, who exactly said uh, something like this. So to different degrees, the learning continuity has been hampered everywhere by the same obstacles and the same challenges. Lack of connectivity, a digital skills uh, deficit, uh, digital device still being there, unprepared teachers and limited options to keep the youngest learners engaged. For one third of all students, uh, more than 500 million, as I said, there was no distance learning. And for a vast majority, there was no digital learning. We have little evidence yet on the effectiveness of, uh, of distance learning programs, but indications are that disengagement and dissatisfaction ran high. And this is something we have to take into account in our discussion and uh, you know, planning for the future. Technology and connectivity are now uh, a real uh, and integral to building more resilient, more flexible and open systems. And UNESCO's Futures of Education Commission calls for a broadening of the right to education to encompass the right to connectivity. This is a very important dimension. It's about rethinking the concept of right to education and enlarging, including this new dimension in, within. We are launching the Lifelines to Learning Initiative that aims to prepare the ground for a declaration on connectivity for education. And uh, some of our partners like ITU, UNICEF will be crucial in this process. UNESCO's overriding concern is how the shift to technology reliant distance learning is exacerbating educational disparities. This is a bit of the message we launched from the very beginning of this crisis, uh, uh, the risk of uh, being uh, uh, amplified uh, inequalities uh, around the world is really still here. And we have, uh, 
And we have also warned that an increase in reliance on private business providers could pose a risk to education as a human right, as a public service and a common good. Uh, on the other side, of course, we also recognize that uh, uh, including uh, the private sector in this, uh, uh, in this uh, new shared common collective responsibility and commitment very much needed today to education is another important lesson already be learned. Well, ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, in this, uh, in this contest, I wish to make a, a singular and very simple appeal. Let us together define how to use technology to help meet uh, the enormous challenge before us inclusively and fairly. What we do need is another evaluation of what didn't work. This is the first step. During this event, let's, uh, let's look back only in so far as it can inform and improve our future actions. This is why day one will facilitate the sharing of effective policies and effective approaches. We are fortunate and lucky that to have many ministers with us who can help us benefit from lessons they've learned in their countries. And uh, I suppose today have, uh, yes, uh, Minister of Education from Finland, Ms. Anderson, thanks for being with us. And uh, uh, Minister of National Education from Senegal, Mr. Uh, Mamadou Tala, thanks. Merci beaucoup pour être uh, avec nous uh, aujourd'hui. Uh, day two, uh, day two uh, of our event will showcase innovative decent learning solutions that are uh, making a difference for learners and teachers. And uh, you will see exhibitions, uh, you'll see demonstrations and very good practices uh, of carefully uh, selected tools, strategies and program. And finally, the third uh, day, uh, we'll seek to outline a policy and research agenda to help us build back our education system. It's about a bit more the future perspective. We should be wise to capitalize, I'm sure, uh, on the progress uh, and, uh, and we should be able uh, to, to see and to explore new avenues for learning uh, and, to, and to find new solutions. Well, uh, to conclude, uh, I think that uh, uh, we have uh, another common mission uh, to accomplish in the coming days and weeks. It's about protecting education budgets. Uh, it's about uh, protecting education as a sector from this uh, crisis, which has already uh, demonstrated a huge impact on economic uh, and financial system, systems all over the world. That's why we are convening next week uh, a global extraordinary session of the Global Education Meeting on the 20th and 22nd October. And, uh, and uh, let, me, let me also size this opportunity to thank donors that have supported this conference, including, uh, among the other, Ericsson, uh, GIAZ, Huawei, Microsoft, NORAD, and Profuturo. And uh, once again, thanks uh, to ITU, represented by the director, Doreen Bogdan Martin, our long standing partner and co organizers of this conference. Uh, thank you, uh, all of you, for continuing the force and your engagement, and I wish you uh, a very productive and successful conference. Over to you, uh, uh, Sabi. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, ADG Giannini, for uh, setting the scene and, um, and, and providing the background and the links to some of the global policy concerns uh, at the moment. Uh, with no further ado, I'd like to now give the floor to Ms. Doreen Bogdan Martin, Director, Telecommunication Development Bureau at the ITU. Um, as mentioned by, um, uh, by ADG Giannini, our long-standing partner over the years for Mobile Learning Week, and one of the first to step up to the call of the Global Education Coalition. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Director uh, uh, Maureen, uh, uh, Doreen Bogdan-Martin, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Sobi. Um, Madam Stefania Giannini, Assistant Director General for Education, UNESCO. Excellencies, distinguished colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to you all, and welcome to Mobile Learning Week 2020. Uh, ITU is once again very proud to be partnering with UNESCO 
um, this time uh, as, as a first virtual edition, uh, as Stefania has, has just mentioned. This year's theme, Beyond Disruption, uh, Technology Enabled Learning Futures, could hardly be more relevant given, given the current situation in which the world finds itself. The COVID crisis has turned our world upside down and the impact on the education sector has been immeasurable. An estimated 1.5 billion students have been affected by rolling school closures in just about every country around the world. Hundreds of millions of young people have started a new academic year behind a screen instead of in a classroom. And teachers and educational developers continue to scramble to adapt content to the online environment, often with very little prior experience of what that entails. This dual crisis impacting public health and public education has raised a huge number of issues. For those of us working in the field of digital learning, we face a very challenging time ahead, but also a very exciting one because COVID noted it, it's sort of turbocharged work in the digital learning space and the potential for positive outcomes is tremendous. The UN Secretary General's roadmap for digital cooperation emphasizes the critical role that the internet and broadband connectivity will play in our efforts to achieve each and every one of the 17 sustainable development goals. I was particularly encouraged to see digital connectivity front and center in so many of this year's UN debates, particularly during the high level week of the UN General Assembly. Yet the harsh reality right now is that almost half the world's population remains completely unconnected. The latest ITU figures estimate that 3.6 billion people are still offline and that hundreds of millions more struggle with connectivity that's too slow, too expensive, and too inaccessible to play any kind of meaningful role in their lives. Many of the unconnected live in rural and remote areas, and they're typically the most vulnerable members of society. COVID pushed 94% of young learners out of school and forced countries to switch almost overnight to online learning platforms. That worked well for a few lucky ones, but what about the billions without access to meaningful broadband connectivity? Right now, an estimated 250 million children remain out of school, and with 30% of youth aged 15 to 24 lacking any kind of internet access at all, we can only imagine the catastrophic effect that this loss of learning could have on these young people's future prospects. Young girls are at special risk, and we were reminded of this yesterday as the world celebrated the International Day of the Girl. To mark that occasion, ITU and UNICEF launched a joint report towards an equal future, reimagining girls' education through STEM, showing that the world faces a learning crisis and a skills crisis that is leaving girls ill-prepared to develop critical knowledge to participate in the fourth industrial revolution. Many of you will have seen the recent warnings from the Malala Foundation that 20 million school-aged girls impacted by school closures may never get the chance to resume their education once the pandemic has abated. Unsurprisingly, household internet access has emerged as a critical factor in this shift to online education. <clears throat> Yet according to ITU statistics, fewer than 50% of households in developing countries have any kind of internet access at home. And this falls to an alarming 12% for households in least developed countries. And of course, for young learners especially, it's extremely hard, if not impossible, to follow lessons via a phone. Yet the numbers of households with a computer are even lower still with fewer than 40% of homes in developing countries dropping to below 10% for LDCs. Ladies and gentlemen, 
finding new financing models to get network infrastructure into underserved communities is clearly going to be vitally important. But infrastructure alone will not be enough because making use of technology enabled learning tools and applications requires digitally skilled people. Teachers need to understand how to use and capitalize on online learning environments. And students need the skills to be able to engage with those environments in a productive and effective manner. And of course, let's not forget about the challenges that parents face. Right now, we are still very far from this reality. In all countries and across all sectors, the world is confronting a huge digital skills gap. The lack of digital skills constitutes a major obstacle for every nation in striving to develop effective policies to drive digital transformation. Research by ITU and others indicates that the lack of digital skills is one of the main barriers to internet use in low-income countries. And that means even in areas where internet access is available and affordable, people are not connecting because of a lack of digital skills. That lack of digital skills among both teachers and students has been a major impediment to introducing distance education during the COVID pandemic, even in the world's most developed countries. And the digital skills gap is a major challenge for the business community as well. Most jobs today already, re already require some level of digital skills. And this need to be digitally competent will only become more important as the world transitions to a post-digital age where digital is no longer a feature, but a given. At the ITU, the critical importance of skilling present and future generations is driving an increased emphasis on skills development, digital skills development, and capacity building. Our ITU Academy platform, our Centers of Excellence programs, our education-focused campaigns and programs like Girls in ICT Day, our Girls Can Code camps, our digital transformation centers with Cisco, which are targeting a broad range of demographics and, and skills levels from basic digital familiarity to professional level accredited qualifications. Aimed at grassroots communities in the developing world, we now have nine digital transformation centers that are operational across different regions, providing basic digital skills training to underserved communities, including youth and girls. And we're very pleased to have cemented a new partnership with Norway to further support this initiative. During the pandemic, we have also accorded a special focus to teacher training, offering specialized courses on remote learning strategies. Because school connectivity has never mattered as much as it does, building on the work of the Broadband Commission for Sustainable Development and its working group on school connectivity that we were very pleased to co-chair together with UNESCO and UNICEF, we've added a, a bold new initiative to our digital skills portfolio called the GIGA effort. And the GIGA partnership between ITU and UNICEF and others has the ambitious goal of connecting every school on the planet to the internet and every young person to information, opportunity, and choice. And since our launch in 2019, GIGA has already mapped connectivity availability and speeds for 800,000 schools in 25 countries. And we're working actively with partners to evaluate appropriate connectivity technologies for different contexts, to create innovative financing models, to identify content to empower not only young learners, but families and communities. And I would encourage all of you to read one of the commission's latest reports from that group, The Digital Transformation of Education, and also invite you to join us tomorrow at the plenary meeting where we will be looking at innovative distance learning solutions as a common good. Let me stress that we know that computers cannot replace teachers, but we also know that the internet is the most amazing, most accessible library ever conceived. Connecting students and teachers to this wealth of information in languages they can understand could be the most powerful engine of transformation that the world has ever seen. 
and having broadband internet connection would mean that no child need ever again lose access to schooling, even in the midst of a pandemic like the one that we're living through now. Ladies and gentlemen, this global pandemic has brought with it a great many challenges, but by highlighting the critical importance of connectivity, it has also opened a window of opportunity for action. The pandemic is pushing the education sector to dramatically accelerate its digital transformation. And our discussions over the next three days will provide new insights and concrete examples of how this can be achieved. This issue has never been more urgent, nor the time more ripe. We have a great opportunity before us and we must not miss our moment. I thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Doreen, uh, for these uh, very insightful uh, opening remarks. Um, we would now like to move on uh, to the next segment of this opening session, and we'll be hearing from uh, three national experiences. Um, and to do that, uh, we have with us today Her Excellency Ms. Uh, Lee Anderson, Minister of Education of Finland. Welcome. We have with us as well uh, His Excellency Mr. Gabriel Chang Sun Chang, Minister of Higher Education, Science and Technology of South Sudan. Welcome to you. And we have uh, from Kenya, Her Excellency Maureen Mabaka, Deputy Minister at the Ministry of Education, Communications and Technology. Unfortunately, the minister who was, uh, was confirmed uh, uh, had a last minute uh, cabinet meeting this morning, but we're very pleased to have the deputy minister with us. Um, just in way of introduction, almost all countries, as, as we know, have planned and implemented uh, distance learning strategies uh, in response to the COVID-19 uh, disruption. And six months um, after the initial uh, uh, closing, massive closing of, of schools and disruption, uh, this session will allow us to hear and, and to learn from some of the national experiences in terms of distance learning programs, how these programs and policies have been designed and implemented to ensure continuity and quality of learning during the crisis and during the closures, how have they been guided by uh, concerns for inclusion, equity, and gender equality, and what, what have we learned about the effectiveness uh, of these distance learning programs based on a combination of technologies in a diversity of uh, contexts. Um, uh, Ms. Lee Anderson, I would like to start with you and the experience of Finland, if I may. As we know, uh, Finland has long been cited as one of the uh, very well performing uh, education systems, one of the top ranking countries in, uh, in PISA assessments um, uh, for many years. And according to the uh, European Commission Index, Finland is the third most advanced digital economy in Europe. So we would be particularly interested uh, to learn more about the Finnish experience in responding to the COVID-19 disruption uh, in this particular uh, 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 technological ecosystem um, uh, that we have in, in Finland. Uh, Minister Lee Anderson, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Your Excellencies, uh, distinguished colleagues. Uh, I thank you for the opportunity to intervene on behalf of Finland um, and to share some of our experiences from this year uh, with you. I wish to begin by emphasizing that all efforts are needed to ensure that education, training, science and innovation remain high on the global political agenda. No effort should be spared to ensure that learning continues in all circumstances, also very exceptional ones, and no country can afford, to, uh, can afford losing any single learner, yet, as we know, uh, we are at the risk of facing a generational backlash. After decades of global progress, the right to education is now challenged at an unprecedented scale uh, globally, 
millions of learners may never return to school and girls and women are especially at risk. Dear colleagues, um, both emergency responses and a longer term approach are equally needed. In efforts uh, to build back and become more resilient, policy shifts may be required. There is no quick fix, yet in the midst of emergency response, strategic planning for the future need to, uh, need to guide us in policy development. That is why we think that equity, equality and inclusion must be at the heart of all COVID-19 education responses. To add, the disruption has made it evident that education systems with flexibility uh, and an ability to offer hybrid solutions, which can be adjusted to better suit local and individual needs, are prone to be more resilient, which we have seen especially now uh, during the pandemic. Such flexibilities may range from teachers' creativity, competences, confidence and ability to make decisions on ped pedagogical methods, learning materials and assessment practices, to system level measures to mitigate standardized exams or entrance practices. Flexible systems are thus more responsive uh, and alternative modes of delivery and hybrid learning opportunities must be applied. Dear friends and colleagues, uh, in the case of Finland, I dare to say that overall uh, our education providers have coped well. Uh, highly qualified teachers and the diversity of learning environments, also digital ones, uh, that already were in use before the pandemic, as well as a system built on the foundations of inclusion and support, have all uh, contributed to this. Last spring, we closed our physical school buildings, but we managed to ensure that teaching and learning continued. Uh, the schools were kept open for the youngest children. That means pre-primary and grades one to three uh, in primary education when needed. Uh, early childhood education care and education was provided as before. Although the government's recommendation to care for children at home whenever possible did reduce the participation rate during the spring by 20 to 30%. During these school closures, all pupils with special need had the right to attend classroom contact teaching and all pupils, uh, also the pupils who were in distance learning uh, had the right to free school meals, support for learning, study guidance, and student welfare services, which also uh, to a large extent were provided uh, through different digital devices um, and distance learning methods. However, it is clear that gaps in learning have emerged uh, in terms of equality, which is one of the cornerstones of the Finnish education model. The challenges seem to be similar on all educational levels relating to support for learning, competences in distance learning, and the availability of digital devices. Uh, so you have seen, and we have seen a trend where the differences in background of pupils really have become more visible in a situation where students were uh, forced to, to study from home. Most pupils and students in Finland have a digital device, for example, a smartphone, a tablet, or a laptop. And in general, schools and education institutions also have a reasonable number of digital devices uh, at their disposal. Uh, so many schools also borrowed the digital devices to those uh, students and pupils uh, who need it. Uh, however, while this has enabled the use of digital means in distance education, challenges still remain related to devices and, and data connections. Um, since students do not have the access to the same type of devices. The challenges also relate to the available support and competences needed for distance learning. Uh, for example, 96% of learners in general upper secondary education estimate that they have appropriate devices for distance learning. However, 16% estimate 
that they do not have the sufficient learning skills uh, for this type of education. To add the demand for self-discipline and the need to take more responsibility of your own learning process has caused more challenges to some learners, uh, while other learners have also felt more uh, inspired. In Finland, our core curricula strongly emphasize how to learn uh, instead of just only what to learn. Uh, and the support, proactive communication and encouraging feedback by teachers are vital for ensuring that every learner is on board and motivated. Dear colleague, as we know from the experiences uh, of, in all countries, the crisis has hit those harder who were already struggling before the pandemic. The family background of the students play, plays a role as the capacity of parents to support the child in learning varies greatly. In order to avoid ne the negative longer term consequences, such as marginalization or exclusion in society, it is essential to eve out the effects uh, with rapid response. Last spring in Finland, we reopened all schools for a two week period before the summer break. Uh, which helped the schools to map out the learning gaps and also to plan for individual support measures. Uh, we have made temporary amendments in legislation, allowing decisions on school closures to be made more flexible at a local level, thus also to avoid uh, national closures of schools. Uh, in June, the government introduced a wide range package of measures worth approximately 320 million euros for promoting the well-being of children and young people. Uh, we have called this a well-being package for the young, and it covers the administrative branches of three ministries, the Ministry of Education and Culture, the Ministry of Social Affairs and Health, and the Ministry of Economic Affairs and Employment. And the aim with these, uh, resources and these measures is to mitigate the effects of distance learning and support learning and well-being at all levels of education. Uh, the government also continues with broader reforms on equity, such as extending the school leaving age to 18. Dear friends, uh, exceptional times require flexible measures and a lot of creativity by our teachers. Uh, in Finland, school was were able to organize distance learning rapidly, largely due to highly educated and motivated teachers. Teachers have a lot of autonomy and they know how to put an individual learner in focus, which has been very beneficial to us in this crisis. In recent years, uh, we have invested in digital learning environments and competences uh, of both teachers and learners. All Finnish schools have tutor teachers and mentors for facilitating the use of digital tools among uh, teachers. And this has also proven to be very valuable uh, during the pandemic. Teachers rely very heavily on peer support, on teachers' networks, and the authorities, um, as the Ministry of Education and Culture and the Finnish National Agency for Education and Regional Authorities have then provided guidance and support materials throughout the crisis. And the National Library for Open Educational Resources supports this work. While the ability of teachers to transfer teaching online proved even better than had been expected, it is clear that distance learning can never fully replace physical classrooms. Schools, and I think we have really uh, learned this in the whole of the Finnish society during this year, that schools are much more than just places for learning. They provide social networks for our young. Uh, they provide safety and well-being for all children and youth. And therefore, I also firmly be believe that schools should not remain closer any longer than is absolutely necessary to curb the spread of the pandemic. Dear colleagues, to conclude, Finland highly values international cooperation and exchange of information in tackling the COVID crisis and building resilience for tomorrow. 
it's important that we monitor and do our best to moderate the impacts on learning and well-being. In Finland, the Ministry of Education and Culture has monitored the developments closely together with the regional authorities since the school closures in the spring. The Finnish Education Evaluation Center has also launched a comprehensive evaluation about the impact of COVID on equality in all levels of education. Universities and other actors such as the Trade Union of Education have, have also conducted surveys and we really need a versatile picture and science to enable evidence-based decisions and policymaking uh, after this pandemic. The Finnish government takes an ambitious stand to research-based information uh, and that is why the government invited already in early spring a cross-disciplinary scientific panel of experts to advise and support the work of the government. Science has played and it must continue to play a crucial role in tackling the pandemic globally. It's a matter of life and death to rely on science and to promote the critical media literacy skills of every citizen and every generation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much uh, for sharing the, the Finnish experience. I mean, we see some of the uh, some of the characteristics of, uh, of a well-performing system that was also able to respond uh, uh, to, the, to, the, to the disruption related to COVID. Uh, the flexibility of the system allowing to mitigate um, uh, uh, some of the more adverse um, effects of, uh, of the pandemic on learning and equity in learning. Um, the local and the, the autonomy, uh, the central role of teachers, tutors, and mentors. Um, interesting to note on, uh, and which is a common challenge, the challenge of data and monitoring uh, the effectiveness of these, um, um, uh, of your experience as it is around the world uh, in, in uh, trying to assess the effectiveness of um, the wide variety uh, of distance learning uh, responses and the technologies they're based on. Perhaps one last word to say, and this is uh, clearly shared, um, the conclusion reached in the Finnish experience that no, no matter what type of distance learning, uh, distance learning cannot replace uh, the, the importance of the physical space of the school, the social space of the school, in terms of protection, in terms of well-being, in terms of opportunities for uh, socialization and for learning, uh, I would say, beyond uh, the strictly academic uh, content of the curriculum. Thank you very much for sharing that um, experience. We would now like to move to uh, a completely different context and to the, uh, to the context of Africa. We have two um, experiences to be shared here, um, uh, both from Kenya and South, um, uh, South Sudan. Uh, if I may, we would like to start with Kenya because I know that uh, the Chief Administrative Secretary, the Deputy Minister, uh, needs to leave uh, shortly. Um, but what we would like to hear um, from uh, Her Excellency Maureen Mabaka um, the experience of having combined TV, radio, and internet in, in, in different ways in order to ensure continuity of learning during, uh, during the disruption and, uh, and during the uh, school closures. Um, we would be particularly interested in hearing about intersectoral cooperation uh, that was put in place in implementing um, blended distance learning programs, uh, given that you are at the Ministry of uh, uh, Technology, Education, Technology, and Communication. Over to you, uh, Maureen Mabaka, for the experience of Kenya. Thank you. All dignitaries present, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, greetings. It's my pleasure and honor to deliver this address on behalf of the Honorable Minister, Joe Musheru, Minister of ICT, Innovation and Youth Affairs in the Republic of Kenya, as below. I take this opportunity 
to thank UNESCO for having and inviting me at this forum. I'm delighted to be here. As I set the context for my address, I wish to briefly point out that the government of Kenya in 2015 initiated a digital literacy program, DLP. This was aimed at integrating ICT in teaching and learning in all public primary schools. The program has so far managed to acquire and distribute over 1.1 million digital devices to over 21,000 primary schools. In addition, digital content was developed and hosted in a cloud infrastructure management managed by the Kenya Institute of Curriculum Development, KICD, and over 331,000 teachers have been trained on the digital literacy under the competency-based curriculum program. The outbreak of COVID-19 impacted heavily on the education sector in Kenya. The first COVID-19 case in the country was announced on 12th March, 2020, leading to the closure of all learning institutions on 20th March, 2020. This called for an urgent need to develop strategies to minimize the learning disrupt disruption and this responsibility lay heavily on the Ministry of Education and the Ministry of ICT, Innovation and Youth Affairs. To ensure that all learners continued accessing education following the outbreak of the pandemic, the KICD established the out of class learning system which targeted radio, television, and online learning through the Kenya Education Cloud. KICD partnered with media houses, including the National Broadcaster, Free-to-Air Community Radio Broadcasters, and Faith-Based Radio Stations. Together, they developed and transmitted educational content across the country and the hours of transmission were increased from four and a half hours to eight hours. The radio and TV programs are developed in panel systems where the program producers work closely with content experts to ensure quality output for the clientele. These are intensive round the clock activities requiring top notch expertise and technology. The delivery of education in Kenya is guided by children's right to free and compulsory education premised on the Constitution of Kenya 2010 and the Sustainable Development Goal number four. The educational programs are delivered through ICT platforms as guided by Section 35 of the Constitution of Kenya, the National ICT Policy 2019, the Kenya Information and Communication Act 2009 and Presidential Order Number no. 2 of 2020. The media regulator, the Communications Authority of Kenya, was able to mandate all TV signal broadcasters in Kenya to carry the EDU TV channel. The Kenya Education Cloud is crucial in ensuring steady and reliable storage and access of educational content. It supports the curation of content, system reengineering for the curation portal, and the development of an integrated learning management system and school management system. Safaricom Limited, which is the largest mobile operator in Kenya, offers subsidized data bundles to support the access of educational content by learners across the board. Together with other sector actors, the charges for providing connectivity to homes have also been reduced. A survey was carried out from June to August 2020, aimed at establishing the awareness and quality of curriculum content broadcast through radio and educational television in Kenya during the COVID-19 stay at home period, targeting primary and secondary school teachers and learners. Awareness among the teachers was noted at 90% and 79% among learners. The relevance and variety of the educational broadcast content was rated at 70%, while feedback 
and responsiveness to learners with special needs was observed to be at 70%. The findings further indicated that 67.4% of the primary school learners were aware of the broadcasting of the radio lessons compared to 61% of secondary school learners. In essence, more awareness was registered by primary school learners. On effective solutions for supporting teachers and engaging parents, among the key factors hindering the uptake of educational programs on TV and radio are poor reception, lack of awareness as to how to access the programs, and the lack of the necessary devices and power. Other factors cited include the lack of prior information on the programming, that is the timetables, and poor reception of the quality of presentations or content from the studio teachers. Learners with special needs and some of the teachers in special need education institutions indicated that the lessons did not adequately cater for such learners. The government is considering the strategies below to ensure accessibility, affordability, inclusivity, and sustainability of universal and uninterrupted learning across the country. The first is blended learning. There is no doubt that COVID-19 pandemic has posed a challenge to all sectors, education included. Stakeholders, both in the ministries of education ICT and other sectors have teamed up to recommend blend, a blended learning approach. This involves allowing teaching and learning to continue by applying the traditional in-class model, as well as at home through e-learning as enabled by technology. This approach requires a policy shift and the government has, re has reviewed Kenya's education policy to incorporate e-learning to enable learners access education from wherever they are, facilitated by technology. In addition to the current traditional model, which is based on the physical classroom model. The second strategy is enhancement of the cloud infrastructure for learning materials. Through phase one and phase two of national data centers constructed at the Konza Technopolis, there will be adequate, updated, secure, accessible, and reliable learning materials through the Kenya Educational Cloud. The platform for learning materials will be ubiquitous to enable every learner with whichever device to freely access a variety of learning material. The third strategy is internet to schools, homes, and communities. The government of Kenya has plans to connect all schools and educational institutions to internet services to enable all learners access education equitably as per the sustainable development goal number four, which asks all states to ensure equity and fair education for all. The internet will provide for, link, for a link to the nearby communities to be able to access edu education. To support this, various other technologies have been deployed, among them the National Optic Fiber, fiber Backbone Infrastructure, the NOFB cable, which is over 8,900 kilometers, as well as loon balloons to support 4G connectivity in remote sites across Kenya. This is all embedded within the National ICT Infrastructure Master Plan. Further strategy is, a device, is the devices for learners. The government has distributed over 1 million devices to learners and teachers in lower grades and is now in the process of sourcing for devices for learners in the upper grades to be able to access content online while at school. With review of the education policy, the devices will be accessed beyond the schools through an arrangement with the learners. The government has teamed up with local universities to develop and produce a variety of educational devices for all categories of learners. These devices 
are expected to be easily available and affordable for learners. Once these devices are designed, they will be assembled and manufactured from the local assembly plants. Most components of the devices will be reusable to reduce on e-waste. Further, on teacher capacity development, a suitable training program for all teachers has been developed. The program ensures continuous development of teachers to be able to utilize technology in teaching and learning. The Ministry of Education has upgraded all primary school teaching courses, teaching courses to diploma level, so as to ensure that future teachers are all equipped with knowledge and skills to be able to integrate technology in teaching. The government will supply teachers with teaching devices as well. On technical support, to enable effective support for the program, the government will team up with the private sector to provide robust support infrastructure. Meanwhile, the government is in the process of recruiting 1,000 ICT interns under the Ministry of Education to strengthen this support. Lastly, on the strategies is stakeholder engagement. As provisioned within Kenya's constitution, the government is implementing the digital literacy program through multi-stakeholder engagements where parents, teachers, unions, and key agencies are all involved. With all these strategies in place, the government of Kenya aims to ensure accessibility, affordability, affordability, inclusivity, and sustainability of universal and uninterrupted learning across the country. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. Thank you for sharing the Kenya experience and, 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 and the um, illustration of working across sectors in particular obviously education and ICT, both in developing um, uh, the out of class learning system on a number of technologies, the mobilization of uh, national and faith based uh, broadcast media, but also in en enhancing the cloud infrastructure, the optic fiber uh, backbone, uh, an excellent example of uh, the technology and communication media sectors uh, working more, more closely with, uh, with uh, education. Um, I would now like to, in the interest of uh, time, uh, to keep moving on and would like to move to um, the, um, the, uh, the case of uh, South Sudan. Uh, and we have with us uh, His Excellency, the Minister Gabriel Chanson Chang. Um, we know that South Sudan has relied heavily on uh, the use of radio in its distance learning programs and we would be keen uh, to hear how uh, the deployment and uh, further development of the distance learning uh, program uh, was ensured in terms of coverage uh, for different uh, subject areas and, and, and in terms of uh, grade levels. Um, Your Excellency, Minister, over to you. Thank you, Your Excellency. Your Excellencies, I'm glad to be part of this informative program and uh, platform for exchanging learning uh, experiences. As my two colleagues uh, stated in their policies or in their statements, uh, those are very constructive and encouraging to us, we as South Sudan, who is just uh, starting to cope up with uh, the world at large. Partly because <clears throat> we just came out of war and we are trying to put uh, our house in order in terms of consolidating peace. Uh, today I'll share with you uh, a statement which may not be uh, comprehensive, but uh, it covers only uh, one part of our educational system, because in South Sudan we have two ministerial uh, 
portfolios, one for general education and instruction, and then the other is for higher education, science and technology. And today I will concentrate on the higher education. <clears throat> but uh, generally, uh, the government of the Republic of South Sudan passed a resolution some two weeks ago for the reopening of the universities and uh, uh, secondary schools, primary schools. And uh, we are now in the process of implementing it, uh, bearing in mind the COVID-19 uh, <coughs> requirements. Uh, today, uh, I want to share with you our uh, experience on, on, on COVID-19, and I'll read this statement. Uh, the COVID-19 pandemic has caused the most widespread disruption to education systems in the Republic of South Sudan. At the height of the pandemic, the government of the Republic of South Sudan on the 20th, March 2020, declared closure of all schools and universities. On the 30th, April 2020, uh, <coughs> the 3rd African Union Specialized Technical Committee on Education, Science and Technology held a uh, third uh, virtual meet, ministerial meeting and pledged to continue more of such high-level meetings for joint efforts to use education, science, technology, and innovation to respond and mitigate the disruptions caused by the COVID-19 pandemic and ensure continuity of education on the African continent in May 2020. The Ministry of Higher Education, Science and Technology uh, formed a technical committee to explore options available to come up with a plan on how to ensure continuity of learning during COVID-19. The Ministry, in collaboration with the universities and other strategic partners, including UNESCO, adopted online and offline options as viable mode of education delivery during COVID-19. <clears throat> to achieve this following uh, plan was adopted. All, all the universities were encouraged to establish e-learning platforms. The ministry applied for internet domains to all the universities, public and private. Actually, we have five public universities and six private universities from the Ministry of Information, Telecommunication and Postal Services. This plan was to make use of BSAT technology and private optic cable, uh, cable which has recently reached the country. Uh, each unit within the university is to have its own domain to enable it upload volumes of learning materials in its website for the students to access. Universities were also encouraged to use innovative facilities to support remote learning and to share experiences with other universities in the region, continent, and in the globe. Faced with limited internet connectivity, especially in countryside, online learning was unaffordable for many students from rural and low-income families. The idea of traditional offline distance learning was adopted. Universities were encouraged to establish learning centers in towns and rural areas and in towns without any higher, higher learning institutions. These centers are to be equipped with uh, computer laboratories, internet connectivity, photocopy machines, uh, TV screens, radios, pre-recorded uh, pre-recorded uh, material, and other facilities students would need in pursuing their studies. 
each university will have a coordinator to coordinate the activities between these centers and the main campuses. The students can print, photocopy materials, access internet, receive uh, and how and get connected with the main campus. The whole idea is to avail all the necessary needs for the students where they live and avoid congestion on campuses. This is part of the requirements of COVID-19. In towns where there are high, higher learning institutions, facilities would be shared with the students from other universities who are residing in those towns, provided there should be co coordination and memoranda of understanding to regulate cooperation between these institutions. It was observed that uh, mobile devices fitted with internet are uh, unique, uh, uh, portable, and uh, widespread in many urban and rural settings in South Sudan than computers. So services such as websites, messenger, Zoom, uh, uh, web binaries are convenient means of communication as well as learning. The students are encouraged to use their smartphone to communicate with their lecturers, colleagues, uh, raise questions, download and upload material, and to listen to recorded uh, podcasts. Uh, phones are portable and can be used anywhere in uh, most of uh, South Sudan. <clears throat> the universities were instructed to digitalize books and material in their libraries in form of uh, hard copies so that the students of campus can have access to them. The ministry is currently communicating with private telecommunication and phone operators in the country to invest in education by supporting affordable e-learning facilities. A challenge that must be urgently addressed is how to train teachers and build their confidence in producing learning material for e-learning and off-learning, which would be accessible to a wider audience of the students. Uh, <clears throat> some of the staff from an informal uh, survey conducted have difficulty in using computers and e-learning facilities. In a country where investment in e-learning has been limited, training teachers to, mitigate, to migrate to e-learning is a challenge that has to be reckoned with and addressed. Even with e-learning platforms, still limited face-to-face -face lectures are to be adopted, especially with science-based uh, colleges and also during examinations, provided uh, COVID-19 regulations are observed. Big classes were to be divided into manageable small groups for lectures that may involve practical activities. Although recorded practical lectures and simulations of laboratories ex ex experiments would be accessible to students in remote areas through the centers, it is recommended that limited face-to-face -face lectures is inevitable in some fields. The country is only now embarking on these measures. We are still at trial stage. Only one university has opened and has applied some of these measures. Other universities are resuming studies before the end of this year. Therefore, no nationwide evaluation has been carried out to determine the success and effectiveness of these measures. It has been to, <clears throat> it has to be acknowledged that some existing challenges will require massive investment in education during COVID-19 and beyond. An understanding challenge, an understanding challenge for us in South Sudan is 
limited coverage of network and internet all over the country. Many parts of the country remain without network coverage. The speed of downloading and uploading uh, using phone is a challenge even in urban areas. Thus, in such a situation, equity and inclusivity in, term, in terms of access, though our aims and objectives of this uh, project need time to be achieved. The network and internet connectivity as experienced even in towns get weaker as you move out of the town centers. In fact, even within the town, uh, periphery and suburb areas often experience weak internet coverage. In conclusion, technology enable learning features can help shape the future of South Sudan's higher education opportunities. Republic of South Sudan hopes to draw lessons from a range of education uh, responses during, 20, uh, during COVID-19 to inform the planning of technology-enabled, inclusive, and resilient learning systems for the future. The Republic of South Sudan also aims to take part in any emerging issues and participate actively in pursuing research policy and practice of digital technology enable learning beyond the pandemic. The country seeks to collaborate with other governments and stakeholders in the region and worldwide to enable our universities engage in collaborative research in technology enable learning with the more experienced universities and good practices worldwide. COVID-19 pandemic must be accepted as part of our life that we have to live with. It has changed, uh, it has changed the face of education and revolutionized it forever. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Your Excellency Minister Gabriel Chan Song Chan, Minister of Higher Education, Science and Technology, Republic of South Sudan. Thank you for sharing the, um, the efforts being made in terms of developing online and offline uh, strategy uh, in, in, in South Sudan. Some of the, uh, with a particular focus on higher education and, um, and uh, some of the challenges. But your call for um, your, your invitation for greater cooperation and, and collaboration is, uh, is very well received. And I think the Mobile Learning Week and this virtual conference is also one opportunity to connect uh, across countries, but also uh, with partners. Thank you very much uh, for, your, uh, for your intervention. Um, we have, uh, uh, before going on to the very last segment of, of today's opening session, which is a keynote, we do have uh, a few questions that have come in. I will not address them to the panelists uh, because we, we don't have the time, but just to signal some of the issues uh, that are uh, being brought up. The broader issue is how distance learning is changing the what the how and, and the when of learning, what to learn, issues of content, the how to learn, the teaching strategies and processes, uh, but also uh, issues of when and the timing, uh, in particular when we have partial school reopenings, uh, the scheduling of time for face-to-face uh, face -face, um, interaction uh, between teachers and, and students. There were also um, uh, a question or a concern uh, and, uh, around strategies to reintegrate students into face-to-face -face education after uh, long months of online learning uh, or confinement um, in, 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 the, in, the, in the context of the COVID health uh, crisis. Um, a, uh, an issue raised about um, technology and the inclusion of 
learners with special needs. Um, and a further and last uh, question around technology and secure assessment. And we heard um, in this morning little about that, but I am sure that there will be opportunities um, for, for those issues to be brought up in, in subsequent uh, sessions. I'd like to now move on to the last segment of this uh, opening session, which is a keynote. It's a recorded keynote. Um, we do have, um, uh, we have a series of uh, keynotes that will be delivered throughout these three days. Um, and they are keynotes by invited EdTech uh, leaders. Um, let me just remind us that education as a collective societal endeavor is also a collective responsibility, a responsibility uh, uh, first and foremost of governments, but of all partners uh, involved. And this includes public private partners um, uh, who need to be mobilized uh, to help advance our uh, common agenda for equitable access to connectivity and to learning. So our first keynote is um, by Mr. Ken Hu, who's deputy chairman of Huawei. Uh, Huawei recently signed an agreement with UNESCO, uh, providing support to advance connectivity and to test technology-enabled uh, open school uh, models. So we will move, it is a pre-recorded uh, keynote. Um, so if we can get the video ready. Uh, so first keynote by Mr. Ken Hu, Deputy Chairman, Huawei. Colleagues, if we can get the video up. Good morning, afternoon, and evening to everyone. It's great to see so many people join us online. Thanks to UNESCO for holding this important event. For the past few years, I have taken a personal interest in education. I've met with students, talked to teachers and principals. And one thing that always amazed me is how passionate everyone is about education. The urge to learn and to teach is strong, especially in remote communities. Let me share a quick story. This is Jay Tong. He's a high school student in Xichuan, a county in the middle of China. He lives together with his little brother, mom and dad, in a small rented room. His parents are migrant workers, and money is tight in his family. During COVID, all the schools closed and started providing online courses. But this was a problem for Jay Tong and his little brother because his family doesn't have a computer or tablet. They only have one smartphone for the whole family. Jay Tong and his little brother had to share the phone to take classes online. They had no Wi-Fi, and the smartphone signal was only strong enough on the roof of their building. So Jay Tong had to go up to the roof to attend his classes. When he finished, Jay Tong would give the phone to his little brother so he could do the same. This was during the winter time when the temperature gets as low as five to 10 degrees below zero. The urge to learn is so strong and so is the urge to help. When local officials learned about their situation, they gave the boys a computer and helped them install Wi-Fi. Now they have better access to online courses, and they can stay warm inside. This is a small help, but it will have a huge impact on their lives. Today, I want to talk about that impact and what we can do to help. To me, education is a promise, a promise from governments to their citizens, from communities to families, and from us to future generations. 
it's a promise that every child will have the tools and the information they need to lead a better life. However, in many ways, we have not kept that promise. COVID has made this painfully clear. At the peak of the pandemic, more than 190 countries shut down schools, affecting more than 1.6 billion students. Of course, the number is lower now, but the fact remains that many students in the world still don't have access to online classes, and they're not able to return school at all. There are many reasons for this. One of the biggest reasons is a lack of digital inclusion at all levels of a society. There is a major imbalance in connectivity, access to devices, and the digital skills. For example, in terms of connectivity, in high-income countries, 87% of the population has internet access. But in low-income countries, it's less than 20%. Income gaps within developed countries also tell the same story. For example, in the US, 60% of low-income families don't have reliable access to the internet or computer. So even schools provide online classes. Students in these communities cannot participate. The gap is clear in both rich and poor countries. Children in low-income communities have an equal access to learning opportunities. This is a direct result of the digital divide. There's a lot we need to do. However, sometimes it's hard to know where to start. But we need to remember that for many big challenges, we can start small. Start with what we know and what we do the best. At Huawei, for example, we know connections and we know digital devices. So we started a program called Tech for All to make sure that every person can benefit from digital technology and that every person has a place in the future digital world. In education, we are focusing on two main areas, connecting schools for kids and building digital skills for young adults. Let me give you some examples. Back in February, I took a trip to South Africa. While I was there, I paid a visit to a primary school in Johannesburg. The kids were great super smart and eager to learn. But they have a unique challenge at this school. This is their computer lab. You can see some bikes there and some old books. It's basically a storage room. They have computers, but they have never used it. I asked the principal why. He said they don't have anyone to teach computer classes or to maintain the equipment. And the school doesn't have internet access. So having the equipment isn't enough. They need more resources and capabilities. Huawei knows technology, and we have some resource in this area. So we teamed up with local partners to see what we can do. The partnership is simple. Huawei provides network equipment and mobile devices. An NGO called Click Foundation provides online curriculum and content. And the local carrier, RAIN, provides free network access. We moved quickly. The kids will soon be able to take interactive classes online, starting with English. By the end of this year, our goal is to connect the 20 primary school schools in South Africa and cover 100 by mid-2021. 
this will have a direct impact on over 50,000 young minds. We're not stopping there. With the pandemic, distance learning is more important than ever. The best way to build a distance learning platform is the cloud. Cloud gives us the ability to fully connect the schools, create and manage coursework, and bring accessible content to people at home. So connecting schools also means connecting them to the cloud and connecting them to content. Here is an example from Senegal. When schools shut down in Senegal, the teachers were in a difficult situation. They had never created distance learning content before. Working with UNESCO and the local partners, we're providing teachers with equipment and the digital skills to create content for video and television. This project has already helped more than 200 teachers to provide their students with quality content throughout the pandemic. Moving forward, the end goal is to bring distance learning to more than 100,000 students. We're also working with UNESCO on an open school project that will connect the schools and build distance learning platform for remote communities, starting with Egypt, Ethiopia, and Ghana. This is a meaningful program, and I would like to invite everyone to join us if you want to help. Outside of schools, adults need help too. There are many young adults around the world who don't have the digital skills to participate in the growing digital economy. To help address this problem, we joined a DigiTruck program in Kenya last September. Here is a picture of the truck. It's a 40-foot steel cargo container that we converted into a mobile computer lab. And it is 100% solar powered. Inside, it has laptops, smartphones, wireless broadband, and even, and, and even VR devices. Trainers from a local NGO drive out to remote villages to train young people on digital skills, including how to use computers and the internet. Since September of last year, more than 1,500 people have taken courses on digi digital technology and online work. Over 25,000 hours of training. This is a joint project with Close the Gap, Safaricom, and UNESCO. We will be expanding this program to many other countries next year, including France. This is one of the DigiTruck students, Caroline. She lives near Nairobi with her family. Caroline is a hire stylist, and she took DigiTruck training to help her business. Before the, the DigiTruck came, I actually never knew how to use computers. It was my first time. I was taught how to use it and it brought so much impact unto me. Now things are done using technology, not like there before, and it has made things much easier. There are so many people who want to learn, but they can't. But there are also many people like you and me who want to help, and we can. Maybe you're good at curriculum design, Maybe you're good at training. Maybe you can develop applications. If we each do our part, kids like Jay Tong won't have to study on the roof. Students in South Africa can learn better with digital skills. And young adults like Caroline can learn the skills they need 
to thrive in growing digital economy. We can do this. As I said, education is a promise. It's time we keep that promise. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, even if it's a recorded video. Um, thank you very much, uh, um, Mr. Ken Hu, uh, Deputy Chair of Huawei, for some of those examples, some of those inspirations, um, uh, and examples of uh, how we can keep the promise. We are coming to the close of this session. Um, I would like uh, to, first of all, thank <clears throat> all of the speakers. Um, her Excellency Lee Anderson, Minister of Education of Finland. Uh, His Excellency Gabriel Changson Chang, Minister of Higher Education, Science and Technology from the Republic of South Sudan, um, as well as uh, Maureen Mubaka from the Ministry of ICT's Innovation uh, and Youth Affairs in Kenya. Um, thank you all for your contributions. Thank you also um, uh, for those who have um, uh, contributed questions or ideas uh, through the chat. Finally, thank you to Doreen uh, Bogdan Martin um, of the ITU, our longstanding partner in uh, Mobile Learning Week. One last word just, uh, just before closing the session uh, to remind uh, you that uh, the program continues with breakout sessions uh, on separate links. Um, these links have been provided in the chat um, and uh, they are also on the program itself. Uh, so looking forward to further uh, engagement and further sharing of experience and inspiration in uh, the sessions to come. Thank you all. And this closes our session for this morning. <laughs>